Go ahead. All right, wonderful. So thank you all for being here. Uh, there's a huge interest in this webinar. My name is Emily Santiago. I'm a licensed educational psychologist. And um, this is part of the Trauma Informed Specialist program that we have uh, that's been going on for a couple of years. And so we open it up for guest lectures. And today we ha it's a real honor to have my former professor, mentor, you know, colleague, and the advisor for this program, Dr. Greg Jennings. And he has uh, been a, a big ins uh, inspiration for me in focusing on resilience, really building uh, healing communities within our schools as school psychologists. And it's great to have him come on to, to talk about collective well being today. So thank you so much, Greg. Great. Thank you, Emily. Uh, welcome. Hope everyone is awake. I see a few faces and just want to thank you all. I see one of, another one of my colleagues, Roxy, uh, is in the building. So thank you for being here, Roxy. You know, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, I know about you all, but I've been in many, many Zooms. So <laughs> the fact you're spending your Saturday morning after Zooming through the week as an educator or a supporter, I just say thank you. And I thank you to Emily for inviting me. Um, I have a sense of urgency. Um, and when I teach, I typically share that urgency that in spite of these times where worldwide there's such um, fear and suffering, minority, minoritized communities have been experiencing suffering for quite a while. And so today's topic is collective well being, I think, very important to not only keep a sense of hope, but also to think about ourselves and our roles in supporting others. So I, I, again, I thank Emily for inviting me. This is my 25th year at Cal State East Bay. And I think each year it gets better and better and better in terms of connecting with colleagues and knowing that the work that you all do as educators and supporters uh, really does make a difference. So I thank you for having me. And so what I'd love to do is go over uh, what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, given my sense of urgency, I'll try to move as efficiently as I can and spend time for a little bit of reflection because I think we all need to reflect as we take care of ourselves. So here's our intro. Uh, just talked about you know, why we're here. I'm gonna be talking about the challenges in risk and resiliency, because really that's my background in looking at not only research, but also working in communities of those factors that make things more difficult and those incredible protective factors that make uh, hope likely. I'll be talking about collective well-being from a few perspectives, particularly from a cultural, artistic perspective, something a little different for me. And lastly, I'll end up with a strength-based perspective in thinking about multicultural issues as it relates to not just risk, but uh, strengths, okay? So let's go ahead and um, before we do anything, Emily, you're gonna record our session today? It's being recorded. Okay, excellent, good to hear. So I'll be talking about you know, what we need to do to uplift communities, but we need to start with ourselves. I don't know where you all have been in terms of your mornings or how you've been in terms of getting your kind of a sense of self, but I'll be talking a little bit about our bodies, our spirit, and our creative mind. So to start with, I'd love to just share with you, I need your energy. If we can all take a couple of breaths together. And in doing so, we're gonna breathe in through our nose, out through our mouth, slowly as possible. We call it straw breath. So when we breathe out very slowly, we activate um, a relaxation um, response. And as we breathe in, we're thinking of just taking in as much information as we can. So let's breathe in together, breathe in slowly. And slowly as you can, out through the mouth. Good, very nice. One more, breathe in. And slowly as possible, out through the mouth. Excellent. Now, uh, I don't know about you all, but I've been shrugging sitting down a long time. So I'm going to gently roll my shoulders. So if you want to, great. If you want to turn off your video for a second, you can do that. It doesn't matter to me because I'm on myself, relaxing my shoulders. And I'm going to just turn my head very slowly in both directions, very slowly. So I'm chill. Look up real quick. Ah, uh, and down. 
Okay, now I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm relaxed. Um, so let's move on to our spirit. That was our body, being aware of our energies, hopefully having some relaxation. I want to move to our sense of spirit. Um, I have so many heroes. I would like to share one of my heroes. One of my heroes is uh, Dolores Huerta. And Dolores Huerta is one of my heroes because like um, Ella Baker, she had a phenomenal community organizational sense. She still does. And for Dolores Huerta, um, for many years, she was seen as, oh, Cesar Chavez's partner, as opposed to this incredible organizer during the farm workers movement. She was able to bring Latino and um, Filipino American communities together. She was able to really look at the humanistic needs of families and communities during a, a turbulent time in the 60s and 70s. So one of my quotes, favorite quotes from her is that every moment is an organizing moment. Every person, a potential activist, every minute a chance to change the world. And I really do believe that, that we have a chance to change the world. Her spirit is so powerful. If you ever get a chance, her documentary, um, Dolores, is phenomenal. So I encourage you. I don't know where you can get access to it right now, but she, in her life, in her example, in her independence, in her sense of resiliency, uh, just moved me in terms of how selfless she was and is. Okay, so let's continue with our sense of spirit. Um, Donovan Livingston, back in 2016, delivered a pretty phenomenal um, con convocation and, um, speech. So I'm going to read his announcement, his convocation speech. He said that education is no equalizer. Rather, it is the sleep that precedes the American dream. So wake up. Wake up. Lift your voices until you have patched every hole in a child's broken sky. Wake up every child so they know of their celestial potential. I've been a black hole in the classroom for far too long, absorbing everything without allowing my light to escape. But those days are done. I belong among the stars, and so do you, and so do they. Together, we can inspire galaxies of greatness for generations to come. No, sky is not the limit. It's only the beginning. Lift off. So Donovan Livingston uh, actually wrote a little book called Lift Off, and you can access it, and you can get that book. And for me, it really inspires a sense of dream. And I think that's what we really need, not just now, not just during our incredibly difficult times, but at all times, we need that sense of lifting off without limits. Hmm? So speaking of dreams and um, without limits, I want to inspire you for just about a minute and a half, if that's possible. I want you to think about just a little bit a big dream that you have, something you've been thinking about. It could be as an educator, doing something unique in your teaching. It could be as a support provider, changing a system. But just take a second to think about it. And if you have access to pen and paper or your computer, just write it down because I'm gonna be asking you to share that big dream in a little bit. Write down your big dream. Now I'm going to ask you to think of a small dream, something that you can do today, tomorrow. It doesn't require a whole lot of work, but something you maybe have been putting off. Write that down as well. Small dream. Write down a small dream. So we've had a chance to think about our bodies, relaxing for a bit, seeing where we are. We thought about our spirit in terms of feeling inspired. We thought about a creative mind in projecting, thinking about the future. It's time now to think about how we use body and mind and spirit in thinking of, of well-being. And we're not gonna talk about a dichotomous, you're well or not well, but we're gonna think of multi-facets of well-being, as well as how culture plays a role in that sense of wellness and well-being. I've run across a, a very good, um, what's to call it, overview of well-being, uh, actually from Sydney, Australia. And the shape you see on your screen here is, is, is not accidental. We're going to take a little bit, uh, take a look at some art a little bit later. Um, 
Aboriginal peoples in Australia have, have for centuries taken a look at a sense of, of wellness from a holistic perspective. And the circle has represented a symbolic sense of community and interdependency. So as you see on your slide there, when we think of well-being, it's not just um, you know, physical, it's environmental, psychological, cognitive, mental, emotional, social, physical, obviously, financial, spiritual. So these multiple concepts are very important in most communities historically. It's only in the you know, past 30, 40, 50 years that we've shied away, particularly in psychology, and become much more individualistic. So part of my task today is to help us think about the collective sense of well-being. And to start that sense of collective well-being, we have to think about the kind of the core of the concepts, at least in positive psychology, that emerge from research in risk and resiliency. That's my background. So from UC Berkeley, I studied, read about, listened to some great folks who really had an understanding that it's not so much about us being, you know, made it, we're resilient, or not made it, something else, but it's a dynamic tension or balance developmentally and situationally between risk and resiliency. Mm -hmm. So let's think about this for a second. Risk is the probability of a negative outcome based on our current strengths and status. So when we hear the word risk, think about probability. When we think about resiliency, think not just about the potential to bounce back, but our state in the here and now to find you know, a way to deal with, cope with, navigate against challenges. That's risk and resiliency. So one of the first challenges in thinking about not just collective well-being, but also risk and resiliency, I call it deficit perspective. Um, Tara Yasso, who at the time was at uh, UC Santa Barbara, wrote a great paper. And I think Emily posted that paper. Did you post that paper? Great. Thank you. So you all have access to this paper. A really nice perspective of uh, what it means to have cultural capital. And here's a, a really good quote that uh, Tara Yasso had in 2005. She said, one of the most prevalent forms of contemporary racism, racism in U.S. schools is deficit thinking. Deficit thinking makes the position that minority students and their families, not just minority students, but minoritized communities, are at fault for poor academic performance. Because A, students enter schools without the normative cultural knowledge and skills. In fact, sometimes their cultural background are seen as a deficit. They don't have the language, they don't have the right attitude, they don't have the right values. And B, parents neither value nor support their child's education. And we know that's not true. I've worked with some really, really impacted families as a school psychologist, and I've not met any parent, even if they were not able to get themselves together. I've not met a parent who didn't want something for their kids. So that's one challenge. Uh, deficit perspectives, one end of a dichotomy where we see the students, the families as the problem. They don't have any strengths. On the other end of a continuum, there tends to be an overgeneralization of res resiliency in some communities. So for example, all kids are resilient, they just bounce back. You just throw some water on them, dust them off and they're cool. Or the, the idea that uh, time it heals all wounds, just give them enough time and they'll be fine. Well, there's a problem with that in that resiliency isn't just about a one-time state. It's long-term, it's dynamic, it's developmental, it's very complex. So there is a danger on both ends of the continuum, seeing a kid as being completely resilient or seeing them as completely at risk. And so one example I wanna share with you comes from a very good assembly bill with fantastic funding and an awareness that bullying among uh, students who speak a different language or part of the LGBTQ community are at greater risk. So we wanna diminish um, the stigma of certain populations. Assembly Bill 413, which is focusing on not just supporting um, funding, but also, this is pretty current, looking at replacing uh, at risk with the concept of at promise. So it says existing law uses the term at risk to describe youth for purpose of the various provisions in both Ed Code and Penal Code. This bill deletes the term at risk and replaces it with the term at promise. 
And what I found interesting was that, yeah, that's a great term, at promise. But we have to be very careful not to typify and to equate one's resiliency or risk or probability with their identities. Hmm? The danger is, if I see every kid I see who's experienced something difficult is at promise, have I honored what it took to get to the point where they are? Have I diminished the challenges they've experienced? So to the assembly bill writers, I don't diminish their good work. This is important, uh, a, a very important step. But I would caution, we don't want to see folks as either or at promise, uh, at risk. Rather, we want to acknowledge the balance it takes for us to cope with hard times. Hmm? Okay, so let's take a look now at what the experts, um, when another of my heroes said about risk and resiliency as it relates, I think, very deeply to a sense of well-being. So we're going to talk about risk and resiliency from my hero, uh, Amy Warner. Amy Warner um, died not too long ago, about three years ago, was at UC Davis and was one of the first ex uh, researchers who took a look longitudinally at how kids were able to thrive in spite of negative conditions. From 1955 to the mid-90s, she followed a group of students um, now, the, we, we think of Kauai as, as kind of paradise and wonderful and all that, and it is, but she was very interested in collaborating with another researcher, Smith, who lived in, in, Hawaii, and, in Kauai, and found a group of individuals in the community who didn't have running water. Uh, there was a very high re prevalence rate of um, substance use, um, just really difficult times, perinatal and prenatal stressors. And what she found was that in spite of these challenges, there was a trajectory. Actually, over time, the children she followed got a better sense of wellness, physical, emotional, social, had very stable experiences and so on, um, with some limitations. But I honor her because before her research, we saw things very much as, well, if you come from that side of railroad tracks, you're not gonna end up very well. Or if you're on this side of railroad tracks, you're gonna be great. So here's what she said about risk and resiliency as it relates to our topic today. She says, as long as the balance between stressful events are protective and protective factors are favorable, that balance is favorable, successful adaptation is possible even for youngsters who live in high risk conditions. It's like the youth in Kauai, but there's a however. However, when stressful life events outweigh protective factors in a child's life, even the most resilient individual can develop problems. Ah. So Amy Warner was cautioning us not to be either or, looking at this as a dynamic perspective. So now I wanna show what that dynamic looks like and have you all think a little bit about um, some of the kids perhaps you've worked with. We know from Garmezi and Warner and some others that one of the factors in thinking about what makes life harder for some individuals developmentally is environmental stress. Hmm? So environmental stress is significant, whether it be community, uh, whether it be the classroom, whether it be the family context. And we can imagine during this time of, of shelter in place that there in, there's an intensification of some environmental stresses for those poor communities. I mean, I'm sure we can think of many other environmental stresses. We can also think of developmental stresses. Hmm? So I'll give you a quick example that I'll use throughout for a bit. I worked at a middle school, phenomenal middle school, that um, did a pretty good job of understanding the developmental challenges. And so among these challenges of middle schoolers, they're, they're pre-teens, early teens, um, bodies, minds, spirits changing very much and very rapidly, a lot of confusion. Think of middle schoolers as always half-baked, not quite big enough physically to fit in with adults and not quite cognitively developed to understand abstractions. But they get it. They understand that there are stressors that they're under their control and some that are not. And so if you think about from preschool all the way up to early adulthood, developmental transitions also provide a sense of, of change and stress. On the positive end, there are many environmental supports out there for individuals within families, within communities. We could spend an entire lecture thinking about some of those supports. Um, this is where 
Amy Warner, um, gosh, a whole bunch of others have really focused on the, this, the essential um, issue of caring relationships, such that those who have that balance between stressors and supporters have caring relationships and meaningful participation, um, a sense of accomplishment and so forth. And lastly, individual strengths. We focus so much in psychology on individuals, but it's important to balance out both the external and the internal, individual and supportive. So in the middle of, is coping. And from a wellness perspective, coping is essential. That is, in the here and now, thinking about those situations that are challenging, that don't overtax our supports. So part of what we do as a community is connect with, whether it be through teaching, counseling, whatever we do, thinking about where people are. So we'll be talking a bit about how cultures have focused on the relationships in terms of coping. Okay, let's push that away and um, move on to a point of inspiration. So thinking of coping, another of my hero is Zora Neale Hurston. I don't know if you all are familiar with her. Uh, their eyes were watching God, Sula, and some others. And she said the following, sometimes I feel discriminated against, but it doesn't make me angry. It merely astonishes me. How can any deny themselves of the pleasure of my company? It's beyond me. So she had this sense of critical hope, a uh, collective hope that regardless of what people thought of her, she knew she was all together. I can't wait. There should be some uh, movie about her. She reminds me a little bit of Queen Latifah. She's got that edge on her. So I, I love Queen Latifah to play at some point. I'm all sure right, let's talk there. about collective well-being. What's that? I said, I'm shocked there isn't a movie about her. Yeah, there should be. She was amazing. She, she actually was a, an anthropologist um, by training. So she went around and, and, and pulled stories from all kind of unlikely places and turned the characters in some of those stories into her novels. Um, so she was a brilliant person, not just a good writer, but a, a fantastic scientist and anthropologist. Brilliant she was. All right, finally, we get to our key topic of collective hope uh, and well-being. So um, there's a book that I've had for a little while. I'll, I'll put up to the camera real quick. Um, Sean Genwright wrote uh, Hope and Healing in Urban Education. This is what it looks like. It's backwards, I think, on some cameras. That's OK. Um, but he's got a couple of key things we're going to be talking about and applying here. And one of them has to do with you know, we can think about collectivity and we can think about well, well-being, but how do we put it in the context of community? That was the challenge I had for a little while. So here's a quote. He says that collective hope exists between the experience of neighborhood conditions, collective understanding. That's critical. What do we have in common that we understand about our status? Hmm? Uh, understanding of those conditions and actions to change the condition. That's critical. That's that hmm, sense of agency. Collective hope contributes to well-being. That is, when we share a common understanding of what we can do, what we can change, then as a community, we become healthier, become well, we become focused. That is, when residents, young people, or community groups act to improve the quality of life for the group as a whole, the process of moving toward those shared uh, goals engenders not just existential outcomes such as purpose, imagination, meaning, and faith, but also we get a sense of purpose that propels us to move from where we are right now to a future place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical. Uh, so in summarizing this kind of sense of well-being as a, as a community, it's important to note that we all are in the same place. Some of us are experiencing a sense of suffering, others surviving, kind of navigating, uh, still others, hmm, I think I've got this down. I've got some challenges, but I can deal with it. And then some others thriving in a place where we can actually help uh, to encourage others. And so in the next slide, you'll see um, what came from um, Predileski in 2008, some very good concepts on the continuum of social justice um, that uh, Sean Genwright was able to put in a very nice uh, continuum here. So take a look at this, if you will. Um, now, Emily, do they have their slides as well? Um, I think you're muted. Yeah, I posted them on the website and I sent a link to people uh, okay. that had registered. So I will. I will very good. That out okay. People need it. Excellent. So this is a, this is a slide that I could spend probably an hour and a half just on. I won't. Trust me, that would be too much. Um, 
but this continuum really has changed the way I think about non-dualistic, uh, non-dichotomous perspectives of not just risk and resiliency, but well-being. So at any point in time, all of us could be somewhere along this continuum. The kids I've worked with, the families I've worked with, my own family. Um, so just going from uh, left to right, a sense of suffering means that oftentimes not only is there what seems as an, a, an impossible to change conditions, but there's a sense of powerlessness, a sense of loss of hope and an internalized uh, oppression. Now, surviving might still have a, a real sense of overwhelm, but there is an adaptation to circumstances a navigation of conditions. Um, there may be persistent conditions, but there is almost a seed of hope. Hmm? Then along that continuum, challenging. There is a sense of critical consciousness. That is, I understand where I am, but I also see my role in making change. There's a rejection of status quo. Like, you know what? I'm fed up with this. I had enough of this. And there's some sense of promise for conditions improving. Now, along that continuum, at the, the point of thriving, there's a sense of autonomy. Like, wait a second. We as a community are powerful. We can make a change. And so there's a, a sense of collective consciousness and peace about where we are. There's almost an optimal condition that's evolved. Now, it's important to note that, that we, at any point in time, things can change, but that we often, at a point of thriving, are able to lift up others. At a point of challenging, perhaps we're just able to stay in a place where we're you know, stable and, and can encourage ourselves. If we're surviving, maybe we're seeking out some support. And at suffering, we need help. And this is kind of a theme that we'll see in some of the research uh, that Emily will be working on in the near future, I take it. Thinking of in the here and now, where are you dynamically? Um, so to think about these key concepts, what I've thought about is where do we make concrete our community's work along this continuum from suffering to thriving? And I thought about this for a couple of years. And I've, what I've come up with is we do it in art. So I wanna share with you, you don't have these in your slides, but I wanna help you all to concretize these key concepts of suffering to thriving. I wanna share with you some art that I've really experienced um, as is enlightening with me. And I'm gonna start with a picture that's closest to where I grew up, right in walking distance from the house and the community where I grew up as a kid, spent a lot of time. So you'll see on your, your slide I'm sharing with you now, uh, a pretty phenomenal um, mural that is, to me, kind of the essential point of what suffering looks like when communities are understanding its impact. So if I were to show you a pure picture of suffering, we would be overwhelmed and, and really deflated. So I, I'm not showing that. Um, for me, this mural shows in the shackles and the chains and the fire and the hands, metaphorically, um, some key concepts of what suffering feels like. You can't see it, but in the far, far corners, um, the mural says, I believe in America in which there's an end to, and it, it lists things like ending mass incarceration, ending torture, uh, increasing freedom of speech. And so for me, these artists did a phenomenal job of showing that transition between uh, suffering uh, part, yeah, suffering and surviving. And the hope is, in spite of these conditions that we feel sometimes cannot be changed easily, there's something to look toward. There's a mobilization. So that's a critical mural for me. The next mural I wanna share with you is one of um, surviving. And uh, I saw this picture uh, from John Biggers. I think he painted this in 1940s, 1950s. Um, I was at the University of Texas in Austin uh, right after, right during NASP a couple of years ago, National Association of School Sites. And I was going down um, the, the um, art gallery and I stopped all of a sudden. I thought, whoa, this picture is really pulling me. What's going on? And I looked at it. I thought, oh my gosh, my first reaction was, this is trauma. I don't know if this is a church or a schoolhouse or whatever, but there's been a, a fire. It's probably an arson. And then I look at the figures there and I thought, wait a second, this is not about trauma. This is about navigation and surviving. Um, John Bigger's phenomenal power there. I mean, I actually started tearing up when I was looking at this picture because I saw these incredibly powerful tall women 
Um, one is holding a child, another is looking directly, two actually are looking directly at the fire. There's an elder holding kind of a sense of hope symbolically, it's this lantern, he's looking away. And then what caught my attention also is in the far corner, you see these children playing together, almost like pandemics, playing ring around the rosy, thinking about nothing but being a child. And then there's an adult who's along with them and guiding them. And it really moved me. Um, as I think about our pandemic right now, I think of how many elders are facing incredibly difficult times, but yet they're surviving. You know, the hope may not be in front of them, but they're surviving and they're encouraging their communities just by their presence. To me, this is uh, surviving. The next slide comes from San Francisco. And to me, this is the perfect example of um, challenging, right? So instead of facing the challenge, in this case of gun violence, um, this hashtag was in gun violence together. And I thought that, wow, this is the beginning of control, of hope. And I love that this little girl is facing away from you, the audience, and she's painting this beautiful mural. It's almost a meta mural. This is a mural of someone painting a mural. And the transition point is, we're taking action, action and there's a sense of ownership, like, yes, I'm doing something about a problem. Now, it may be overwhelming. There may be people in this little girl's community that have not experienced a sense of hope, but she's taking some action here as depicted in this mural. Hmm? This is in San Francisco. And so the last mural I wanna share with you uh, is in, comes from Oakland. And I saw this a couple of years ago. I hope it's still there. I have no idea if it's still there. To me, this is thriving. These two young people are in charge. When I looked at this, I almost felt embarrassed. Well, here am I, you know, going to get some lunch, and they're out there, <laughs> you know, starting their community garden. They're exercising. They're challenging you. So I felt like a little guilty, like, dang, I'm just here having lunch. But these young people are in charge. <laughs> they're thriving. They're actually able to empower others because they have it together. They've made those steps as young people, you know? So for me, Looking at this mural, looking at those other murals in contrast, they all represent one thing, and that is well-being. Well-being at the point of suffering looks different than the well-being of thriving, but they're all well-being. So we're going to resist thinking of well-being as a single point. We're healthy, we're rich, we're physically able, we're not experiencing difficulties. No, that's baloney. We're always going to be challenged. But we can think of culture as hmm, shared understanding of what coping looks like where you are in the here and now. That's culture. Hmm? The last picture I want to share with you um, pretty much combines and summarizes all four of those areas. I was in Seattle a couple of years ago at the Seattle uh, Art Museum, SAM, and they had an exhibit of Aboriginal art from Australia. Blew me away. So this uh, particular piece of art, I wrote down the, the folks, uh, come from the Kakacha peoples um, in Australia, uh, Aboriginal art here. And when I first looked at it, I was just moved by how beautiful, how fluid the design was. Um, and part of the exhibit, they talked a little bit about the historic perspective that uh, European societies saw Aboriginals as having no art. And they were right because they hid all of their art for ceremonial, religious, and pres preservation purposes. They were very smart. And when slowly but surely uh, Aboriginal artists started sharing their art, we realized that not only did they have art, but they had some of the most complex artwork um, known. So I'm gonna share with you an up close picture. That, by the way, the curators got really anxious with me, or nervous when I took this picture and then moved really close to the art. <laughs> and I'm, I've been followed around in art galleries before, but I'd never had like three people converge on me. So it's okay, I was fine, because I treated this with respect. But if you look at this picture up close, I was fascinated by this. Um, the artists take a stick, dip it in paint, and make one dot at a time. So you can imagine how long it takes to make I don't know, a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dots in this huge piece of art. Each dot represents some story. So you can imagine if you have a dot telling a story and you have five thousand stories and the space between dots, the space between communities, the space between lines tells us something about resistance and resiliency and collective work. How many stories 
are really being held and shared within Aboriginal communities. Hmm? So that blew me away in terms of how communities through their art and through their culture can support next generations. Okay. All right, how do we make this concrete for our work in the here and now? This is a big transition point. So take a deep collective breath and let's move on. I wanna talk about um, something I've been working on for a couple of years. Strength-based multicultural perspectives in intervention. This is something we can do in classrooms, something we can do in our own homes, something we can do in the people we work with. If we're therapists, we can think about not just identifying strengths uh, within a cultural context, but thinking about the multiple layers of work there is to do. So here's how I, I depict it. We're very familiar with individual differences. Um, in fact, I think that sometimes we focus too much on this as opposed to multiple layers, such as relationships. I've always been fascinated asking youth about, tell me something about your friends. I've had some kids say, I don't have any friends. I say, okay, well, tell me about the friends you'd like to have. Tell me about the people in your home. Tell me about the people you interact with. This tells us a whole lot about how the social experience works in schools and communities. We've talked a little bit about the environment. So all those pictures we saw were examples of the context of environment whether it be points of oppression, points of freedom, points of autonomy, those are important. Typically in schools and communities, we look at individual relationships and environments in terms of the problems. The way our minds work, we look for patterns for survival sense um, that may create problems. We're problem focused in terms of our wiring. What I propose is that it takes work to think of strengths at the individual relationship and environmental level. That's our task. I think if you're a teacher, if you're an educator, if you're a therapist, if you're a school psychologist, social worker, school counselor, no matter what you do, part of our challenge is to think of strengths. So this individual who is always in the principal's office sitting down, what does she bring as an individual? What are her relationships like? What are her environmental positive experiences like? And then lastly, we think of culture oftentimes from a deficit perspective is, Oh, this culture doesn't even have the same language. They don't have the same values. They speak too loud. They speak too soft. They don't make eye contact. They don't do this. As opposed to within that culture, thinking about Aboriginal art, thinking about John Bigger's art, thinking about those murals, what do they bring that is of incredible value that is priceless and, and can't be matched with other cultures? That's the challenge. And I think part of the, the challenge for me is trying to understand the narrative of families and communities from a cultural perspective that are pure strengths and values and capital. Oftentimes we think of capital is, as riches shared from one generation to another, but we know that that's not the, the sense. Um, wellness and capital have very little to do with money alone. There's so many other factors. So in the next slide, I wanna share with you a perspective of um, cultural capital that comes from a cultural perspective. And so in particular, um, the work of uh, Tara Yasso in 2005 really inspires me to think about this when it comes to well-being and identifying strengths. So as you can see in this picture here, ah, I notice that there are these circles, concentric circles, which kind of reminds me of Aboriginal art a little bit here. So we can think of aspirational capital within families as not so much, I want you to do this or that, I want you to be a doctor, I want you to be a lawyer, but it's having a hope um, that is specific to the needs of family and communities. And so every family I've worked with, I've never worked with a family, even those who are very, very, very much having difficult times and struggle, they want something well, um, they want something good for their kids. So that's aspirational capital. Family capital. I know for my own family, I'll speak on a couple of these um, strength areas. For my own family, my mom was fantastic about reaching out, um, particularly in times of need, to others around her. So she was kind of the bridge within my family and within our local community at times. So I had so many uncles and aunts and, um, you know, uh, folks who, who knew me before I knew myself. And because of them, that extended family, I was able to thrive in some ways I would not have been able to otherwise. Social capital is a little different. That might be uh, a church, a synagogue, a mosque, uh, a connection within, uh, within the community. So think of this as the, those connectedness within community that help us in hard times. 
Navigational capital uh, is one of my favorites. I think of <laughs> my entire family um, is a uh, example of navigational capital. That is not just taking a situation and thinking this is a hard time, but finding a way to make things better for self and for others. This is not a selfish perspective. It's finding the right resources, sharing those resources, sharing foods, sharing clothes. I mean, I don't know about how many of y'all out there, but I mean, I had so many hand-me-downs as a kid and I'm so thankful that we had the hand-me-downs and <laughs> so many other good things that came from community. But historically, navigational capital has been the way that people who have been minoritized find a way to make things work for others. That's critical. Um, and next on our list around here, resistance capital is uh, so essential. I think if, if I were to take a snapshot around the United States when schools are in session, all the kids who get sent to the principal's office, those are always my kids <laughs> as a school psychologist. The first thing I would do in, during lunchtime after lunchtime was walk down the halls in middle schools, elementary schools, and sometimes in high schools, and see the kids who are waiting to be seen by the, the administrator. And I'd always get in trouble because I would have the conversation with them almost 90% of them were there because they had some sense of anger about injustice. Sometimes it was not an accurate sense of justice, but it's still, they understood and sometimes spoke out against those things that were going on in their classrooms, in their communities. And I think how powerful it would be to help hone this sense of resistance capital, that is the ability to speak out against injustice, give a format, give a voice that is meaningful as opposed to disruptive in the ways that don't necessarily help their cause. That's leadership. Last key point that you also talked about was uh, linguistic capital. So linguistic capital is, if you speak a second language, speak a third language, speak a language other than English, that is a phenomenal snapshot of not just culture, but communication. And so if we could honor having a first, second, third language, as opposed to seeing its deficit, um, this is truly powerful in communities. So I spent some time on this because I think if we're going to focus on collective well-being, we have to be attuned to the idea of seeking out strengths as opposed to deficits. That's critical. All right. So we've come to a point of time of reflection, and I have two questions here. And if we can do this, I'm going to try to have a, a breakout group here. So Emily, I, I know if you can do this or not. We have, um, I don't know how many folks available online, but if we have maybe groups of four to address uh, two questions, introducing yourselves with maybe sharing one of your dreams, your big dream or your little dream, sharing one of those, and perhaps answering one of these two questions or sharing one of these two. What type of cultural capital have you recognized for yourself? And what potential cultural capital have you seen in a student or youth recently? So pick one of those two questions to share and one big dream or small dream to share as well. And um, we'll say, let's say uh, five minutes for a very short breakout and we'll see how it goes. Okay, and I am typing the questions into the chat in case you forget. Excellent, thank you, appreciate that. And then at the end of our time, we'll come back together and see how it went. All right, so we're gonna experiment on this. I'm just gonna put the breakout rooms, let's see. I'm gonna randomize them in groups of four. And so I'm gonna allow Alicia in. And we'll give you five minutes and then we'll all come back and answer some questions. So thanks, Greg. Right. And it, I think there's always an honor that you're not forced to share. You can come in the group and just observe, right? So, um, so we're gonna put them in. It says 18 rooms, four to five participants in each room. So we're gonna try that out. So we'll see you in five minutes and I'll post the questions. Thanks you guys. Thank you. Open all rooms. That means Greg, you and I may be in a room as well. Okay, not a problem. All right. Ray. Yep. May. Mm -hmm. Did that work out? Is that one that works? No, it's a word. Oh, no. Hi, everybody. If you, uh, I unmuted everybody. So if you've got background noise, you may want to mute again. Um, 
think uh, we've got a pretty big breakout room for us. So, so I'm Emily, if you guys wanna check in and uh, share out one of those big dreams you have, or you wanna turn on your video, you can, and then you can share uh, a kind of cultural capital you might have recognized for yourself. So anyone wanna turn their video on and say hi? I see you having you there. Gabe, are you uh, from Cal State East Bay, if I recall? So. Yes, hi, good morning. Hi. So if you guys wanna engage in our little breakout chat, anyone's willing to, to share like a, a big dream. Um, for me, I share Greg's dream and shifting from always focusing on the individual to building these environments that promote resilience and building environments where, you know, that path to resilience is accessible for, for all people. So that's what I'm hopeful for. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, if you don't want to turn on your video, or your sound, you're not, you're not obligated to, you can put it in the chat if you want one of your dreams or the idea about cultural capital um, in yourself or in others. You can do that. Try a couple more minutes. Hello. Hi. Who's here? I was by myself in that, in that room. <laughs> oh, you were by yourself in a room. How strange. Yeah, I know. Oh, I don't know why. It said it would put people in groups of four to five. So not sure uh, what happened there, but welcome to this group. Yeah, you can move around. So. Um, Rosa, we're just chatting about big dreams or types of cultural capital or anything that came up for you in, in Oh, cultural capital, I guess I, I'm bilingual, mm -hmm. I'm of Latino descent, I um, live in different countries, mm -hmm. I um, actually went to school in different countries, so, and now in the middle of Western Pennsylvania. Okay, well, welcome to the call. Yeah, I definitely think shifting, a lot of schools see kids who are bilingual or who are learning English as something that's a challenge or a deficit and switching yeah. it to an asset and uh, something that enriches the community. It's also been proven that being bilingual um, helps you learn better. So yeah, you're right that those are huge sources of cultural capital and need to be seen that way. So yeah, for sharing that and just navigating different school systems. You said that navigational that's capital <clears throat> is huge. I I tell you, the things you learn by always being the new kid in the block, oof. Yeah, but you build a lot of skills and you, and I think sometimes when you go through that, you must know you can handle whatever comes at you in some way. Yeah, not, maybe not at the time, but afterwards you realize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing. What's your role in, in schools now or your role? In the I'm a uh, school psychologist. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Anyone else want to share their experience with cultural capital or cultural capital you've seen in a student? If you're on. Um, in our program, we talk a lot about uh, resistance and defiant, reframing defiant behavior instead of seeing it as something to be suppressed or to be um, squashed, we try and reframe that so um, and see it as a survival skill. I'm oh. going to close. Yeah. So if you kind of look at it and say, okay, this is a kid really working to survive, really questioning things, um, you can you can help them channel that in a more positive way rather than just destroy it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like suppress yeah. it. Yeah. So that's what uh, he talked about re resistance capital, which is something we kind of need right now. So I'm going to close all the rooms and bring everybody back. So I'm going to send everybody a message. I'm going to close all the rooms. Um, 
Thanks for coming back, everybody. Nice to see you. Hi, Mina. Hi, Emily. <laughs> yeah. Me too. I'm going to mute everybody again, just so that uh, we don't get a lot of background noise. So, and when we have questions, I'll unmute people. So. All right. Are you back, Greg? Did we lose him in one of the breakout rooms? Okay. Okay. All right. Trying it out. It worked. All right, Greg, thanks. Um, we, we were able to have the discussion, so thanks for trying that out. Um, Thank are you. you you have a few more slides or are you open to questions now? What works? I have a few more slides if it's okay with everybody. If, if y'all are hanging in there, um, that'd be great. And I appreciate it. I was at my small group. I wanted to thank uh, everyone in my small group. And uh, Jane got cut off at the end, but I really appreciate the focus on family. Um, so uh, let me go to share my last few slides if I can. Um, can you see the slide? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? How much time would you like to give me for, to wrap up? Um, how about you do five minutes and we got a couple for questions. And if people want to, if you don't mind giving a couple minutes after 11 to answer some questions, people can hang out or they can. Absolutely. Go. Absolutely. All right. And I can see a few more faces. Welcome. Uh, faces I didn't see last time. Great. So let's um, move from a reflection to a quick summary. So here's my summary if it will work. Let's see, for some reason it's, it's uh, either freezing or just not happy. Okay. Let's see. We can see all the slides almost because we see both at the same time. But, um, right, so I'm trying to summary. move to the next slide and I think it should be okay. Yes, here we go, here's our summary, wonderful. Okay, all right, so in summary, of what we've talked about so far in risk and resiliency as they relate to a sense of well being. First key point many of the negative behaviors, sometimes we focus on negative behaviors of youth, uh, oftentimes are attempt to cope with stress. And that's always been helpful for me to see that kids do well when they can. We, we know, you know, Ross Green talked about that in his book and some others that when kids are not able to see an autonomous path, a wellness path, a well-being path. Many of the behaviors are not about being disruptive for the sake of being um, disruptive. So if we put that in perspective, during this time um, of, of shelter in place, there are going to be acting out behaviors. I know many districts are seeing kids who are showing what is, has been deemed inappropriate behavior, sexualized behavior, disruptive um, kinds of comments. Kids are trying to cope with not knowing what's going on and how they're gonna be connected to their friends and so forth. So I think if we put in the context of stress and coping, we can go a long way. Second, um, <laughs> one of my big dreams is separating risk from identity. I've worked with so many kids who've seen themselves as the bad acting kid, as the stupid kid, as the kid without abilities. And so, it doesn't happen um, by accident that we can separate identity from risk and outcome. And so it takes a conscious effort on our parts, every conversation with a kid who's suffering, with a kid, with a family who's having a hard time, to not only acknowledge strengths, but to separate the identity. You are more than the risk. You are more than the challenges you face. Third key point, dynamic resiliency is not a feel-good term. So when someone says, oh, you're so resilient, I say, oh, thank you. <laughs> but beyond that, um, it's hard. So someone who's coped with challenges has faced many difficult times and, and needs as much support as possible. So let's not typify on the positive end. And then the last key point we talked about, that well-being is a balancing of risk and supports. So... Given that it's dynamic nature, we always have to be aware of where people are. And so if we can gather information, be connected, we're gonna be much stronger. I have many more things, but I'm gonna leave you with one last image, and it's a strange one, but that's okay. Um, 
<laughs> about a year and a half ago, I was out in high school visiting and I sat on the most uncomfortable bench of my life. It was a drizzly day. Uh, my pants got wet. I was freezing cold. Someone made a bench in a high school made out of pipes. This was a terrible idea. But for me, it was a metaphor <laughs> that if we're going to have the collective well-being, we have to design environments that are welcoming, that are connected, that are supportive. If we make benches out of pipes, there's no hope that we're going to find a more connected experience uh, to gather and to be present. So eventually, this pandemic is going to be in a different place. Impermanence tells us that everything as a point in time. But until we get to a point where we can all together, let's not build any more pipe benches. Let's have some pipe dreams, perhaps, but no pipe benches. Okay. That's all I have. Many more things I could share, but I really appreciate the time. I feel honored to have shared some things that have been in my heart, and I, and I would, would love to have a couple questions if folks want to um, raise a question. Emily, are you going to just share some, read some, or, or what would you like to do? I'll call some people out who posted questions, and if people have questions, if you could just post them, and I'll just call on you to ask them. I think Michael Essien, uh, principal in San Francisco, had a question. So Michael, if you're still on and you want to unmute and ask your question, I think that'd be great. It's about how educators can support individuals um, whose identity changes based on where they're at. Yeah, so uh, good morning and thank you uh, for this uh, webinar and for the invitation and we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, my question is thinking about like, kids are, are uh, complex. And so even like you're talking about this resiliency, whether I'm good in math, science, ALA, social studies, like kids are moving from different environments, with PE, navigating lunch, um, depending upon the social group you might be a part of. Think about how do you begin as a as a leader, as a teacher, how do adults in the building begin to construct an environment to support kids building resiliency as they navigate these various spaces um, during the school day? Excellent question. Wow, I have about three layers of answers, but let me repeat the question. How do you support a sense of resiliency given that kids navigate between different places, different environments, even within school campuses? And at an environmental level, I think about a middle school, I think of two middle schools um, I've been a part of. I was, one was a trainee, other as school psychologist. Very similar in terms of some challenges. Kids coming from their homes to school had to go through some communities where it was a turf war going on at the time. And just to navigate from point A to point B created a great sense of stress and how am I gonna protect myself? So at one middle school, they actually had noon duty, what we'll call it aides, like warning security person. They were just kind of um, milieu positive support folks who would stand on some corners and just connect with the kids. One um, young man in particular had graduated from uh, th that same um, middle school and, and the, the feeder high school. And his job was just to connect with kids during the day. And I have to tell you, he was probably the best counselor I ever met in terms of spontaneous connectedness because he was from community. So on one level of, of answering your question, I think what we can do at a, an ecological level is spend the resources on connectedness through caring adults during the school day, as many as we can afford, as many as possible, with the purpose of um, what used to be primary intervention program or PIP programs, caring others or caring friends whose job, whose training, whose resource is one contact making one thing better for one kid at a time. And I could give you about 10 others, but that was for me the most impactful, probably the, the best use of resource is having caring individuals who connect, could remember their names, could say, yeah, I had Miss Jones too as a teacher. I, I went through this as well, who connected. Um, another quick response, data. Um, my good colleague, Dr. Mike Furlong at UC Santa Barbara has what's called cold vitality is his measure. You can look him up just if you type in C-O-V-I-T-A-L-I-T-Y. Cold vitality is a co-occurrence of positives. Instead of comorbidity, cold vitality is a co-occurrence of positive things. If we do a screener in schools and find out who are the students who have outliers in terms of their individual and collective uh, connectedness, we could actually build a multi-tiered system of support within schools. Very complex, but there's some great articles. If you just type in keyword Mike Furlong, F-U-R-L-O-N-G, 
his writing and his colleagues' writing address that at an ecological uh, community uh, level, where there's some fantastic resources um, that he and his colleagues have provided. So I, uh, kudos to his work. He's going to be joining my class uh, this upcoming Tuesday. So those are two things. Caring relationships at a, at a physical plant level and then data collection to do uh, school-wide screening is so powerful. I recommend the DESA Mini for that. I don't know if you have a tool that you recommend, Greg, but I've used the Student Strengths Measure, the Devereaux Student Strengths Measure, and that's worked really well. It has Excellent. Been. Yeah, some kind of screener. There, there are multiple out there. Um, they're even at a, at a, a informal level. There are the 40 assets by the strength. There is a California Healthy Kids Survey that is, has been school-wide. So many points, the DESI, the Mini DESI, the Devereaux, there's lots out there. Having some strategy for gathering data at a school-wide level um, isn't just a nice thing to do for grants. It's a way to uh, prioritize resources and identify both positive and negative outliers. Um, because without data, we miss kids who could be potential leaders who are not just thriving, but have something to share uh, because they're quiet. And we miss kids who are well-behaved and perhaps internalizing some deep suffering because they're not acting out. And one way to do that is through screening. Thank you. Um, I see a couple other questions. Uh, Casey, do you want to ask your question about like what to expect when students return to school um, after the pandemic and how to plan for that? Yeah, we work in a, in a wellness center, so it's, but the teachers are seeing the same thing, the most disenfranchised kids. We, they're, not, they're not tuning in, and I'm looking at five months before we return to school. Uh, what can we expect and any resources for planning for that? Yeah, thank you for the question. So the question is, given that you know kids have been cooped up, not connecting with peers, not practicing social skills for five months optimistically, right? What, do, what can we expect? Well, we can expect, I think, developmentally, very different snapshots and pictures. I think at very young kids, we can expect probably some regression when it comes to how it is to interact, dealing with frustrations with older kids probably much more anger about situations and loss, connectedness with friendships. Dynamics of friendships are gonna change significantly, right? And just duration and focus, it's gonna be hard for me to work in a physical way. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm being conscious of social distancing and so forth, but the risk is that we've become more isolated. So I'm gonna flip the question a little bit and think about not so much what to expect, but what can we create? There's a curriculum called Calmer Classrooms that's free and available. And you're nodding, Casey, so you're familiar with that one? Is it, is it Calmer Choice? I'm a mindfulness yeah. and meditation teacher. No different? No, this is, this is calm, Calmer Class, Calm Classroom. Okay. Um, uh, and I can give that to, if Emily doesn't have it, I can give it to her. Calmer Classroom. I can give it to her. And it's one example of a curriculum that in, in, integrates a bit of mindfulness, but a focus on trauma-informed classrooms. So if we flip that question and think of this time of pandemic and anxiety and, and isolation as traumatic, then we can use a trauma-informed perspective to identify potential signs of trauma and then to diminish the probability of traumatic responses because of the, the transitions that are gonna happen. So I would say, we can expect there's gonna be a full range of reactions from, from gratitude and joy to, to anger, to sadness, to fear. Um, but if we would create environments that are trauma informed in their reactions, like calmer classrooms, there are actually some structural suggestions. Here's what you do day one. I'm old school, so I remember uh, tribes from the 19, late 1970s. And in tribes, there were circles and opportunities um, in the manual for communication and having resolution at the end of days, you know, in, the, in each um, classroom day. So I think those two things, a trauma-informed context in curriculum, direct curriculum, I'm not talking about just having some, some time that, for conversations, but setting up the beginnings of classrooms, having some times for social interactions, having um, curriculum that is, is definitely sensitive to experiences, 
Um, those are all important to me. And so calmer classrooms um, is one example. There's several curriculum out there, but that's just one that takes into effect, into account, pardon me, how to structure a classroom um, to anticipate that there be, could be multiple kids who have experienced trauma. So I appreciate your question, Casey. Hmm. Okay, Emily, were there other questions? see um i didn't see a lot of specific ones i know we've got people on the call like um dr rala lewis has been on the call your colleague yeah. uh, my former professor as well who's also an expert in resilience so he was sharing some links i was trying to cut and paste some of the research that he's done that he was sharing but it wasn't cutting and pasting but i'll send an email with resources great information as well um, I also, Greg is talking about the dynamic nature of resilience and stress. So um, Sarah Shaw is on the call and she helped me build a tool to measure that, that you can measure every month. So I put that link out there and then some info about our program if people want to join and really dive deep into how do you build these environments. So Excellent. Excellent. I think uh, this, this was an incredible conversation, Greg. So thank you so much for just inspiring us today, making us feel hopeful, changing the way we we look at the world, so um, I'm really grateful for your time. You're very welcome. It's an honor to be with you all, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm actually very proud of the community that's being built here. So the Trauma-Informed Educator Program is really the continuation of the conversations we've had at Cal State. Um, my colleague, Dr. Rolla Lewis, and I did, uh, we have a wonderful, we should put a shout out to our Lifescaping book. Um, if you just type in keyword Lifescaping, that's uh, a wonderful example of action research. Anyone interested in connecting some of the challenges in communities with uh, voices, with understanding critical steps you could take to make one thing better in schools. Um, Lifescaping is a fantastic book. So we wrote that a couple years ago and uh, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal example of how we can collaborate and, and hear voices in school settings. So I know that uh, our, our principal locally here in San Francisco had a question. So I would also recommend that book, uh, Lifescaping, because it gives examples of projects done by graduate students, um, curated by faculty members, but it can be curated by anybody, a principal, an administrator, um, social worker, anyone can help students to think about a project making one thing better and going through a process of um, inquiry, thinking about a question, doing a focus group, asking what is it like, what would the future look like, and so on. So I think that those conversations, even through Zoom, can happen where we could take a question, a, a challenge, and focus on what are some possibilities. It would be incredible. Great. Greg, do you mind stop sharing your screen just so we can see? Like Not that? a problem. Yeah, that means it's bothering me. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think we had people from Canada and all across the US and it was just an honor to have everybody here. So thank you all so much and uh, feel free to reach out if you have more questions, but we'll be sending an email with some of the resources mentioned today as well as, you know, it's recording right now. So hopefully it records well and I send you a link with the recording. So nice to see some some people I haven't seen in a long time. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great Saturday and take care. Thank you, Greg. Bye. Thanks, Emily. Bye, everybody.